Hello and welcome. Today we're going to talk about game studios. Uh, you ask me questions, I answer them in, to the best of my ability. I got a lot of questions about game studios. I got 24 of them. Let's see if I can get through at least 10. Question number one. What was a day of working at Blizzard like from start to finish? What was the work location campus like in layout and decoration? Did they have company parties? What did you do on your breaks? Who did you sit by? All the details. I want to paint a pretty interesting picture of working for them in the early 2000s. It's a little stalkery, but okay. A basic day of working at Blizzard. It starts with a two hour commute. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. It was like a one hour commute on the California uh, 405 from my home, which was in an affordable area to the Blizzard offices, uh, which at that time was the Irvine campus. Um, so get in there uh, at least before 9 a.m., sometimes at 9 a.m. And uh, we didn't clock in at that time, though we did have key cards, and I'm not sure how much they paid attention to those, but I, I never got reprimanded for that. Um, this particular location, this was before they moved to the uh, big one with like the statue in the front. This was like a a big office building sort of style with uh, two floors. Initially, I started in QA at the bottom. <clears throat> and for that, you would we would typically go in the back door because that's the direct route to QA. And for that, we did clock in. So you'd clock in, sit down at your cubicle, and start testing whatever the game was. Um, like for Diablo 2, it was primarily creating the checklists and stuff because uh, I was uh, one of the co-leads for checking on items and you would just go through the checklist and sort of make sure that you knew all the prefixes and suffixes and typically reading through design documents to get those things and that would be your day till lunch then you would go to lunch with your friends um, and since you worked there <laughs> those were your friends or your co-workers and uh, we would go to like Red Robins uh, because they had uh, endless fries. <laughs> Sometimes we'd get a beer, especially on a Friday, and then after that we'd come back to work uh, 1 to 1.30 p.m. Uh, unless I wanted to do uh, uh, comic books. Sometimes i go with uh, a friend, Chris, to get comic books, and then we would come back to the office uh, 1 or 1.30, sometimes 2. Uh, <clears throat> and then you would continue your day finish up whatever you were doing around five or six unless it was like uh, a lot of overtime being done in which case you would continue till like seven eight uh, when you were in QA that was clocked time so you would get paid for that but when I moved up into team one uh, that was unpaid <laughs> so once I was on team one the typical day is the same commute you get into work you walk up the stairs this time go clock in uh, well you don't clock in but your key, key card gets you into the building, and I'm sure they track that. And then I would go into, we had our own office with like uh, three people in it. And I had my desk in the corner. So you'd walk in and I have my corner office and um, your corner desk. And I had a shelf behind me full of like toys and crap. Not unlike this, but uh, more specifically like Legos and things like that. And then I would begin my work day working on a map. Typically, I'd open whatever map I was working on. Uh, might be trigger map of the month for StarCraft initially, and then it would be a Warcraft 3 map for the Reign of Chaos campaign and then the, the Frozen Throne campaign. And uh, work on that till lunch. Same thing, go to lunch with my friends around 12 or 1, and then come back around 1.30 or 2. And then continue working. And then maybe towards the end of a day, we might do multiplayer testing or we might test someone's map who had just completed their campaign map and we all needed to play it and give them feedback. Or uh, on certain occasions early on, we would do readings of the, the dialogue for a particular map. And we would all go into a circular office uh, oh, sorry, uh, an office with a circular a round table and we'd sit around the table, we'd all pick parts for, from the dialogue to play, and then we would read the dialogue for the opening and the closing of the mission. Other than that, you know, you know there wasn't much more to it than that. Um, it was a lot of work, <laughs> uh, 
Uh, and on days where we had lots of overtime to do, we would get dinner around like six to eight p.m. and then we would work till like 10 or 11 at night sometimes, sometimes later. There were a few occasions where I uh, would sleep the night there on a couch. I don't uh, do that anymore, obviously, because that's insane. Um, but yeah, um, beyond that, I don't know how to paint much of a picture, but uh, I will include some photos, or you've probably already been seeing photos of uh, some of my day-to-day -day at Blizzard that I, I might uh, have, but most of it is from my time in QA. Question number two about game studios. Uh, I've heard Blizzard wages salary are not competitive in contrast to other big studios. Is that true? So, that is true. And it was more true when I worked there than it might be now. But at the time that I worked there, I think I was making between 45000 and 55000 a year. Which might sound like a lot, but this is California, where rent was at, at a minimum $1,000 a month. So <clears throat> that plus taxes, you were going home with very little uh, per month. It was enough to live, but it wasn't enough to be comfortable and save money. You could either have a very, like, not go to lunch with people to the expensive restaurants and just, like, eat your lunch from home and, like, save some money. If you had a family, you were effed. I was pretty fortunate to uh, just have a girlfriend <laughs> and she wasn't working at that time. She was going to college, but her mother and her college fund paid for all of that. So I didn't have to worry about that. But yeah, it was not, it was enough money for me individually to be okay. Um, but I, I knew for a fact that working at other studios would earn me more. And in fact, after I left Blizzard, I immediately was making like, uh, I think it was like 60 to 75,000 per year, so which is a huge boost compared to what I was making there. The only thing I'll say for Blizzard is that they did have the bonus checks, but the bonus checks were heavily taxed <laughs> and you had to be very careful about spending them. And uh, not a lot of people understood that. And also because I was on the lower end of the bonus check, so I would get 15,000. So when I started, you know, at 45,000, 15,000 brings me up to 60,000, which would have been my salary at, at most other studios at that point, if not less than what I could have been earning elsewhere. So, um, yeah, it wasn't great. <laughs> Uh, I don't, but I can't speak to how salaries are now at Blizzard. Mm. Question number three, which game studios have the best cafeterias or meal selections? Uh, <laughs> I didn't work at that many studios. None of them had cafeterias uh, that I worked at, so I can't really speak to that. The only time I ever saw a cafeteria at, at, a, at anything was uh, when I went to the Apple, Apple campus. So the Apple campus had a very fancy cafeteria with like high grade chefs. And so that was pretty impressive. Uh, but I didn't get to eat there. <laughs> I just got to see that they had that. Um, so yeah, um, you know, the meal selections during uh, Warcraft 3's development were pretty good. Uh, we had like, we would get food from like Wahoo's fish tacos, which is great. And uh, occasionally pizza, but not very often. Um, and uh, I think I remember complaining at one point, hey, we're going through the same restaurants all the time. And it became like a big thing. And like Frank Pierce had to come in and like, well, what are you complaining about, Dave? And I'm, I was like, I just want a little bit of variety. Let's like try a different pizza place or something. Like, oh, people are very particular. You know, if, if it's the wrong food, they'll, they won't stay. It's like, oh, and yeah, ultimately, uh, they were right because we tried a different pizza place and like some people were like, nah, I'm out. They want their consistency. So it's impossible to please everyone in those situations. But ultimately, I don't think anyone should be staying for a dinner <laughs> uh, to do unpaid overtime. I think that's ridiculous in the first place. So whatever. <clears throat> 
Uh, question number four. During your time at Blizzard, did you receive free physical copies of the games you worked on? Do you still have them? I did indeed receive copies of everything that I worked on. And in addition, oh, except for World of Warcraft. And in addition, we would also get other perks. So any merchandise materials that we made for Warcraft, uh, everyone got for Christmas. And there were even things like jackets and stuff. And uh, actually, let me show you. All right, so believe it or not, this <laughs> is the Blizzard 10 year anniversary jacket that I got when I worked there in 2001. And it's the only jacket that I've kept. It's the only piece of clothing from my time at Blizzard that I've kept because it is so good, so high quality, still a hundred, oh, I got a pen in here. It's, it's, it's a really good jacket. And, uh, I've taken this to basically every every country that I visited. So this jacket is seen has some miles on it because it literally has followed me my entire career through the game industry uh, from Germany to Sweden, where in Sweden it was very useful. Uh, and uh, yeah, it's just been a, a very, very cool jacket. It's the best bit of swag I ever got from Blizzard. Uh, though there were other things like a cool uh, World of Warcraft shirt that was very colorful, uh, like a full blown, graphic across the entire thing. Uh, unfortunately, all of the t-shirts and all of the those things bore down over time or I had to get rid of when I moved to China, including my five-year sword, <laughs> which I had to uh, give away. Um, and uh, all of the toys and stuff I also had to get rid of when I moved to China. So <clears throat> unfortunately, the only thing I have for my time at Blizzard uh, is this 10 year anniversary, uh, anniversary jacket. Um, but I did appreciate the way that Blizzard would always um, give us whatever swag they, that, that we were getting from the various games. Uh, that was always fun, uh, especially the books, um, which I read, Lord, I think the only one I read was Lord of the Clans, but oh well. Uh, question number five. What sort of campaign design did you have to do for StarCraft 64? I thought it was a port of the PC version. So, uh, little known fact, the <clears throat> I was one of two people to make new maps for the StarCraft 64 version of the StarCraft. And uh, I was the only one to do an additional campaign for which Metzen wrote the, the story. Uh, or the dialogue for. Um, but yeah, it was basically my concept and uh, Chris Arecci did the layout and then I did the triggers and decided the units and stuff uh, and came up with the characters like Taldar and, Taldar and the uh, Protoss. So it was a port of the PC version of StarCraft, but uh, they put out the call for like, hey, can anyone make new maps for this? And me and Matt Morris were the only two to come up with something. He did um, like a fire bat runner thing, but I, I, I don't remember it very well. But I do remember that, uh, you know, I came up with the infested Stukov thing. So it was it was pretty cool and was basically the entry point to getting into level design and eventually working on Warcraft 3. So that was cool that I got that opportunity while I was in QA, which is pretty rare at most studios. Question number six, what class and faction did you play in Vanilla WoW during its heydays? Um, so believe it or not, I liked to play random and this is, I also would like to like to play random in StarCraft. It was good for testing, but also for familiarizing myself with all the different races. Um, if I had to lean on any particular one, it was probably the the orcs, and the orc blade master would be my first hero out. I just liked the sort of assassination kind of thing, but I wasn't particular to any one faction at the time because most of the time something was broken in the game, um, so I just played random. Um, but yeah, when I went to Battle.net and stuff. Even then I would pick random, uh, just for the fun of the surprise. <laughs> um, question number seven.
Question number seven, what creates a great culture and what creates a bad culture? Uh, I'm assuming you mean for game studios, so. What creates a good culture um, or a great culture is simply knowing what your company culture is. Like if the, if the company is supposed to be about innovation and stuff, making sure that that's sort of instilled in everyone so that people don't get too stagnant and stuck in ways, it's very important. Um, whereas a bad culture basically is one where either they don't know what their company culture is or they have some vague sense of it, but it's not really spelled out. And that's when the problems start to creep in. So if you have like a company culture and it's supposed to be about innovation, but no one really understands that or cares about it, and people are just put out co cookie cutter stuff, then the people who understand what the company culture is supposed to be will get very frustrated. And there's also a lot of issues with like, let's say your company culture is about honesty and transparency, which is part of my personal uh, culture. Um, and then, you know, that's not being met. You're not telling people what's going on with your studio and there's problems and they're not being exposed. It turns into a bad company culture. So it, it really is the congruence between what you want your culture to be, how you express it to everyone at your company and making sure that you follow those values all the way through. I would say that one of the big downfalls of Blizzard has been that they stopped following their own company culture. And part of that can be put on uh, Activision's takeover of it, and one person in particular, who you might know, um, and thus created a bad company culture. But there was also other problems at Blizzard, uh, which I won't go into right now. <coughs> <laughs> Question number eight. What are small incremental problems that destroy the culture of Blizzard? Well, what a great question uh, and a good follow-up to the previous one. Uh, so the small incremental problems that I saw, um, and keep in mind a lot of this sort of crept in while I was there and then it got exacerbated after I left, but was the idea that we were rock stars. And um, it really there really wasn't a rock star culture. It was more like we were a bunch of, the way that we saw it internally, like I can speak for, from personal experience, from talking to like Chris Metzen and Sam Didier and playing Dungeons and Dragons with them, was it was like, ah, we're like a cool group of nerds making cool stuff. And somehow that got turned into like a idea that we were rock stars but we never felt like we were rock stars. I know Chris Metzen never felt like he himself was a rock star. And even though Sam Didier has his own <laughs> band and would like, you know, sing stuff, he didn't feel like he was a rock star either. He was like a geeky nerd doing geeky stuff. But somehow that mentality got out there or that projection got put out there. And when new people came into the company riding high on the success of World of Warcraft, they sort of got it into their heads that now they were rock stars because they worked on this game that everybody knows and so they have all this perceived clout and i don't know how it got to like cubicle crawls exactly because this is after my time but i imagine it had something to do with that mentality of like well we're the bosses of the world we can do whatever we want and like when it gets to the cosby suite that's like where the delusion clearly set in and certain people got out of control um, who, in my opinion, should never have been in a position to do anything like that because I think what made Blizzard so special was its humility and the understanding that we're making cool stuff for geeks like us. And that mentality got lost somewhere along the way. Like, just for example, before World of Warcraft shipped, the idea internally was that it would not be a success, that it would be roughly equivalent and maybe do a little bit better than EverQuest, no one had any idea how ridiculously successful World of Warcraft would be when it launched. And that sort of humility, I think, has been lost over time. And that's what sort of caused that those people who believed they were rock stars when no one ever really put that forward as an idea. like that was not part of the company culture to be a rock star was not part of the blizzard company culture it was to make geeky stuff and just revel in the geekiness of everything and yeah it just went wrong because no one reinforced or in this particular case said whoa hold your horses 
you're not that special. Calm down. Like, the arrogance of it just wasn't supposed to be part of the company culture, but it, it snuck in there. So, <clears throat> uh, a lot of that incrementalism of issues, I think, came from certain hires. Uh, and uh, I think I've, I've named enough of them in the past <laughs> that it's uh, we can skip it for now. Question number nine. What's a fun bug or something that was hard to solve for the team during Diablo 2? I don't know. I wasn't on the Diablo 2 team. Um, <laughs> there were a lot of fun bugs, though. Uh, we had over 6,000 bugs, I think, at one point during uh, QA. When I was in QA, I was working on Diablo 2. There was like 6,000 bugs at one point. Um, and that was a milestone. Um, there was all sorts of weird stuff with the Haradra cube. Um, recipes not working or corrupting memory or something and, and causing problems. I don't remember too much. That, that sort of time period is a blur, unfortunately. So maybe that would be a better question for a, a Diablo 2 developer. <clears throat> question number 10. How much is it all Mike Morheim's fault? Sure, Bobby Kodak is the devil, but why is so little of the conversation about Mike? What gives? Because Mike Morheim uh, upheld the values that Blizzard had been founded on, I'm not saying he's blameless at all, uh, but I am saying that in terms of like the descent of the deliveries to the players, definitely Kotick's fault. And I'll point to the to reforged again as sort of the the turning point where Mike Morheim sort of gave up and went to form his own thing. He literally, after reforged got defunded and like all of the cool stuff that we're gonna do with like the first war got cut. That's when he left the company uh, and went to form Dreamhaven. So that kind of says it all, I think. Um, but in terms of the uh, sexual abuse and the toxic work environment, Mike Morheim definitely can have, should have some blame there. And he has taken responsibility for that on several posts on like X Blizzard uh, Facebook groups and things. Uh, and he even made a public statement about it. I don't know to what extent he takes responsibility or how earnest that is. I can't speak to his internal monologue. Um, I've never, I have not received a personal apology for my own toxic experiences there that he did ignore. Um, but in terms of like, I, I, I can't put too much blame on him for the company culture turning toxic because he he upheld the values of Blizzard himself, but maybe didn't do a good job of distilling those values down to the new people coming in and maybe stepping in with HR and going, this is what's important for our studio and this is the company culture that we need to uphold. So I think as the vision keeper of the company culture, perhaps he failed there too. But um, I still put a lot of the blame in terms of what games came out of Blizzard and how they served the fans, I put a lot of the blame on Bobby Kotick and not much on Mike Morheim. So.